Thank you. Welcome to this community newspaper Facebook program, Excellence in Education. This is Marta Perez, and our mission is to expose and inspire excellence in education. Please follow us on Facebook and send questions via our chat room. We are so pleased to have a most special guest today who exemplifies excellence in education. He is Julio Jose Frank Mora, a Mexican public health physician and academic and the president of the University of Miami since 2015. Dr. Frank was dean of faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chang School of Public Health and before that, Minister of Health of Mexico, the entire country. During his tenure at Harvard, Dr. Frank quadrupled fundraising in the school, which included a $350 million naming gift, the largest grant ever in Harvard's history. He is also credited with balancing the school's budget and launching a comprehensive educational reform effort. As Minister of Health in his native country of Mexico from 2000 to 2006, Dr. Frank reformed Mexico's health system and introduced universal health insurance, which expanded access to health care for millions of uninsured Mexicans. His prestigious awards and positions are too many to mention right now, or we would have the whole show taken up on that. And, but we are so fortunate to have him on our show and particularly in our community. He has written several books, two of which are for young people explaining how the body works. He has also written a book called To Save Humanity. And I want to hear about that because humanity does need uh, saving. He is the married father of two and was recently described as a visionary, insightful analyst, institutional innovator, and pragmatic problem solver. We are so pleased. Dr. Frank, to have you on our show. It is such an honor. Please welcome the most accomplished and dignified Dr. Julio Frank. Please, Dr. Frank, tell us about your very interesting background, how you grew up, and how you got to this point in life. Thank you, Marta. You're extremely kind, and I am <laughs> deeply honored to, to be on, on, on this show today because excellence in education is everything. It's the key to everything else we do in society. Without that, we cannot accomplish any other goal. So I can't overemphasize how important is the, the work you, you, you carry out. Well, <clears throat> you know, um, I think the event that marks my life and actually makes my life possible is um, something that unfortunately we are seeing a little bit of a repetition today in the world, the rise of an authoritarian leader in, 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 in a country, in this case in Germany in the 1930s, that led my, my paternal grandparents to escape from Hamburg, Germany, where they lived uh, with my father, who at that point was six years of age, and, and his one sister, who was four. The, they, they were escaping, um, you know, anti-Semitism, racism, and the rise of what you know would become the most destructive regime in history um they were received with open arms by a country that was much less wealthy in terms of finances but much richer in terms of tolerance of embracing and of generosity to strangers. they they uh went from germany to mexico what where in in Mexico to Mexico City? Yeah, they took a ship, uh, landed in the port of Veracruz, and uh, and then made their way by train to Mexico. They didn't know anyone. My grandmother, who went on to live to the age of 106, <laughs> and was a very important figure in my life, um, knew had taught herself Spanish. She was uh, in uh, in love with Romance languages, so she spoke. <laughs> 
Spanish and French and Portuguese. And, and that was it. Um, they came um, and, and started a new life uh, as, as refugees fleeing uh, Europe in the 1930s. So the, the event that defines my life is the concept of generosity to strangers. Because it's easy to be generous to friends and family. It's natural. But it is not so natural to be, to be friendly and generous to people who, who look different than you, who speak differently th than you, who pray differently than you, and uh, who are escaping, um, well, what we know happened subsequently to those who unfortunately remain in Europe. So uh, my, my grandparents with my dad at, at the age of six moved to Mexico and then went, went on to, to live a life, which of course is a, is a story we see so often in South Florida, right? People escaping authoritarian regimes and finding a welcoming home. My my father married my beloved mother uh, from a Mexican woman. Your your ma your father then grew up. He yeah. he began first grade in. He began his schooling. His uh, uh, schooling. He spoke. Uh, I'm sure your grandparents spoke uh, Spanish yeah. with with an accent. Yeah. But your your father yeah. was. Yeah. Fully fluent. Fully fluent. My father was very proud of his identity as a Mexican. In fact, when World War II ended, they were offered the opportunity to go back. Of course, the Nazi regime uh, stripped them of their citizenship, and they refused. They stayed in Mexico. They wanted to be. My father was always proud of, of being a Mexican, an adopted Mexican, married my mother. My father became a physician. Um, I'm the fourth in on his okay. line, and I have a sister who's a physician. <laughs> so we're two of us, and then we have two nieces who are also physicians. So it's it's a long history of doctors. And my mother was a very gifted piano, uh, classical music pianist. She she gave a number of concerts in her youth, and um, they produced this family of seven. Uh, oh, I, you have six siblings. I have six siblings, including a twin sister. Oh, you have. So, oh, is she so, also a physician? No, she's no. a musician. So, ah. <laughs> you know, we took after each of our respective parents. And what? Where are you in the birth? Right. My uh, twin order. and I are exactly in the middle. Oh. Uh, we have two. Well, not exactly, but two older, and three younger. Uh, I bet your parents were very surprised to hear that they had two children, and then they were expecting twins. Yeah. No, and I where the, the uh, uh, girl boy? Uh, girl boy, then twin, the twins, uh? and then three girls. So oh. I, I am. So blessed that to have five sisters uh -huh. and and one brother, and so I'm I, I'm very comfortable with, with women. talented <laughs> uh, women. I growing up with a twin sister, I have no doubt that women are the improved version of the human species. Oh, so that's so very kind. <laughs> that's great, that, great that, respect that, for okay, women. Okay, a point, 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 points for you. <laughs> So, so that, that 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 you know, my grandmother lived to 106, um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's a story of uh, of a life that could 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 have been sh cut short, very prematurely, mm -hmm. and would have never given rise to me. Yes. So I owe literally my life to the generosity of strangers. Very good, excellent. Uh, I know that. Uh, that has marked you for all your life. Uh, when I have, was researching you, uh, those are the kinds of things that you have written about. And uh, I think those are some of the things that have distinguished you. As a matter of fact, um, humanity seems to be a theme throughout uh, much of your writing and your thinking. Uh, you, I, I have a quote about universities and humanities of yours and it says the role of universities is essential if humanity is to meet the challenges of the 21st century how do you mean that dr frank well if you if you look at the 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 modern university which really finds its center of gravity in the united states after world war ii i mean the first western universities you know, Bologna, the first European, is a thousand years old. Oxford and Cambridge are more than 800 years old. So universities, the, the Western universities, because there were universities in India and China as well, but the Western university emerges in the Middle Ages and has ha, have become this force of continuity in our civilization. But after World War II, 
it showed dramatically the power of science to achieve national goals. The war would not have been won probably at all, or would have taken much longer if there hadn't been the application of scientific discoveries. And I'm not, not just talking about the, the end of the war. I'm talking the war in the Pacific was made possible because of quinine, a, a, a drug to treat malaria. Otherwise, there were more soldiers dying from mosquito bites and malaria than from bullets. So sci science became clearly a, 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 an element to achieve national goals, not just in war, but also in peacetime. And so the United States launches, as part of the reconstruction, this enormous effort to build what we now know as the research university. It has started, it was a movement that started in the 19th century, but accelerates enormously. And the center of gravity of excellence moves to the United States, also to Europe, but mostly the United States as the, the victorious power. And since then, what, what research universities have shown is that they, they, first of all, produce the workforce. They are the, es the essential component in educating the, 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 the workforce of any society and educating leaders. Um, you know, every US president has graduated from a university. And, and the same, by the way, happens in almost every country of the world. Yes, uh, But I it's also been the source of, of great discoveries that have improved the quality of life for millions or billions of human beings. So yes, I, I absolutely, the educating the workforce and the research university, unfortunately, on, on my end, on the smaller, uh, the, the uh, younger uh, students, uh, we find that the, the standards, it, it becomes increasingly, it should become increasingly easier to educate our students. But some of the forces in the community, I think, some of the distractions uh, make it harder. And often you hear, uh people critical and saying you know when i went to school we would be learning this and this and uh and uh, our schools today are not as advanced we also know that uh the most successful elementary schools are either in northern europe or in asia mm -hmm. and that is a concern yeah. because uh the United States, having usually been at the forefront of education, seems to not be uh, hitting the high, is not included in the, in the uh, higher uh, performing schools. So we are looking at that. Unfortunately, so much of uh, politics and, and political things get involved that I think that's part of the problem. But that's not, that's what I think. No, right. you're absolutely right. <laughs> and we depend on that pipeline. Universities depend on the pipeline from the K through 12 system. So the, the work you do here in Miami Dade is absolutely essential for, for, for us to be able to fulfill our own. And and we're own. we are looking at some of the results of the pandemic and they are not good. No. So we continue to to strive, but we need a lot of community help, parental help. A lot of, of, of it has to be a, a whole uh, village to to see how we can improve the trends yes, in absolutely. Miami and and in the United States as well the whole country because we Miami Dade is uh, the top urban school district in the United States I don't know if you knew that but we've won awards uh, thus far we want to keep that as well um, by the way we have a school of education uh -huh. precisely because we want to contribute our own research and scholarship and education of future educators yes as a university because Wonder we understand the absolute the vital importance of case yes and i went and i yes, loved you am I, 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 you're, you're a graduate of I, i'm a graduate and i i did i did i do love the university very much um but now speaking of another part of your job that the beauty of humanity, the, 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 the importance of, of all of these esoter more esoteric uh, views. But then we have the practical part. And maybe you'd like to talk about the importance of athletics. Mm -hmm. And did you, uh, because you had not had this kind of position before. Right. So uh, what are some of your experiences in, in that? And 
Also, the importance of fundraising, which you are an excellent fundraiser. But I know I've had other university presidents here, and one of the biggest parts of your job is that, uh, getting the money so you can do all these wonderful things for humanity. Yeah. Tell us, please, about that. Sure. Well, let me start with the letter because it, it applies to athletics and it applies to everything we do. Um, you know, a, we're a private university, but increasingly not just private, but also public universities do rely on on society. And when, you know, when I moved to a, a leadership position in higher education, which is when I became the dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard University, of course, everyone said this is part of your job. And, and I had not done this before. And um, And as I got into that, I understood something, which is that fundraising is not about asking for money. It's about offering something that's so valuable that a generous human being feels inspired to use that something that you're offering to build a legacy, something that will live after that generous benefactor, like all of us moves on to some other dimension of existence. <laughs> and furthermore, I realize that fundraising is an incredible opportunity to meet really interesting people. Because philanthropist, in the true sense of the word, the philanthropist means love of humans. We're talking about humanity. That's what the Greek uh, origin of the word means. It's people who love humanity are usually, those philanthropists are usually extremely interesting people. They're very accomplished, <laughs> obviously. They've made a lot of money. Very wealthy. <laughs> they're very wealthy. But there's something else because they are going against this very human instinct to protect mm -hmm. what's yours. Uh -huh. And instead of that, they're giving it. And when they give, it's because they have a deep understanding of what it means to transcend. And what I tell everyone who works at the university is, it is our job to create such a compelling vision of what we can do with that support that we inspire these very intelligent, very successful people to actually think that that is worthy of their own transcendence, their own legacy. And when you think of philanthropy like that, it acquires a different meaning. It's yes. not a transaction. It's building a relationship of trust that we as a university are doing things that are very important for the future of, of humanity and that resonate with the deepest and highest motivations of that benefactor. Dr. Frank, take us back to the moment when you heard, this is a done deal, this is going to happen, this $350, uh, $350 million gift is going to happen. How did you feel? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you, that gift and uh, at that point was the largest gift in 375 years of Harvard University. Um, it's it's no longer. <laughs> but, but at well, that you point, it was, the, you set the bar. I set, I set, you set the, the bar. The bar. Yeah. And another dean just wanted to beat me and, <laughs> and he raised the ladder, <laughs> and, which I'm very glad for. Um, but I, I have to tell you, uh, in my inauguration at here at the University of Miami. I moved from that position at Harvard. When mm -hmm. I was offered this job, I, I thought it was a wonderful opportunity. And uh, because first of all, it expanded my horizons. I was dean of a school in my own specialty, which is public health. And I had become so convinced of the crucial importance of higher education while at Harvard, that the opportunity to now lead an entire university and outside of my comfort zone, encompassing every field, not just in science, but also in the humanities and, 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 and the arts, was a very, very stimulating challenge for me. But I also came here because I, I, I do believe that Miami is, is the future of, of the United States. It's the face of the future, just in terms of it, it, its ethnic and racial composition and its diversity of national origins. It also has a geographic location that, first of all, brings me back closer to my roots, which are in Latin America, but also uh, to a city that's incredibly cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came here, I was able to announce on the day of my inauguration in January of 2016, 
a $100 million gift from Phil and Patricia Frost, trustees of the university, mm -hmm. which is going now, it's being invested in the first of what will be several Frost Institutes of Science and Engineering. And That's the building wonderful. is coming up now. It's about wonderful, to be finished. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so so the, both those gifts, which are very significant gifts, for, for um, had one thing in common. They were unsolicited. I didn't have to ask oh for them. Oh my goodness, that's a, that's very nice. <laughs> that is very nice. Both the Chen family, who wa they wanted to honor their father by naming the school. Harvard had never had a school name for a benefactor, except the university itself, which is named after John Harvard, uh -huh. no, 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 none of its schools. And so they set a very high bar. It was the largest gift at that point. But it was not about the money. It was a deep motivation from Gerald and Ronnie Chen to honor their father, T.H. Chen, an incredible person who fled China when the communists took over, went to Hong Kong, and then proceeded to build uh, a very successful business in real estate. And then one of the, the children, Gerald, followed a career in science and was an alumnus of, of the school I was dean of. And he said, I want to honor my father. Can we name the school? And I never had to ask for the gift. Oh, they oh believed in the, in the school. Similarly with Dr. Frost and, and, and his wife, Patricia. And I can tell you, I didn't raise that gift. My predecessor, Donna Shalala, did. But I know that when the Miller family decided to name our school of medicine, similar gift in size, it was because, and similarly that they wanted uh, Stuart Miller and his siblings and his beloved late uh, late mother, they wanted to honor Leonard Miller, the sort of patriarch of the family. There is something in universities, and, and I can give you many, many more examples. Uh, I mean, this Monday, we op just to give you the most recent example, the, the site SETI Institute of Urology, a $20 million gift. Uh, and why? Because you know, Dr. Deepen Perek, who's the chief of urology and the chief operating officers of UHealth, gave them the trust that he would build something of such high quality that that's what they want to associate their name, their family name. And we named the Herbert School of Business. Herbert, uh, uh, Alan and Patty Herbert, two alums who met at the University of <laughs> It's a love st story. A hundred million dollars of lifetime giving to the university, and now it's called the Miami Herbert Business School. And 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 you know so on. I mean, I I I could give many examples of large gifts, but what do they mean? They are all inspired by people who want to do something that they believe is worth, of not just associating their name, but also of building a legacy, and that's what the art of fundraising is all about. It's certainly at some point you ask, or sometimes you don't even ask. ask. But it is because you're, you, and this is my job, is to build something that's so good that it inspires people who are incredibly accomplished, incredibly intelligent, to do something for somebody else as a way of their own sense of transcendence. And, and, and about the athletics, this is something new for you. Yes. So <laughs> this was a new challenge in right. your life. How, how do you see that? Yes. So let me link it then, because part of what we do at the university is build community. And when I moved here, you are right. I had never led an institution <laughs> with an athletics program. Uh, uh, is it fair to ask you what is your favorite sport or not? Yeah, sure. I, 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 um, I, I as, a, as a younger person, I did play soccer oh, in Mexico okay, growing okay. up, and I played a little bit of basketball. Oh, okay. But you only need to see me, and you will realize <laughs> in two minutes that I'm not the athletic type. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that doesn't stop me from understanding the value of athletics, and I actually enjoy and love watching and especially I love being passionate about a team. And now I'm so passionate about the Hurricanes <laughs> that every game is a rush of adrenaline, which we, 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 we very often Good. need. It's, it's, it's full of emotion. It's full of, uh, of uh, excitement. And for me, it's full of, the, of watching these young, young uh, men and women who are incredibly young and so committed and so, so cool to be playing sometimes in front of tens of thousands of people and performing uh, at a very high level. It's all about the pursuit of excellence in everything we do. 
and athletics in particular is an integral part of the educational experience. But furthermore, it's you know it's the way we it's a it's a major way in which we build a sense of community, not just for our students and faculty and staff, but for our community. I know that the Miami Hurricanes um, are different teams, especially football, but also basketball and baseball and women's and men's basketball, the, a women's soccer team, which is very good, and all the 18 athletic disciplines that we cultivate. These are a source of pride for the for for Miami, and and I'm very aware of so, that role we play. So you were living in Boston, and you have, uh, and now you you come uh, to Miami with your family. Uh, you have twins. Right? No, I, no, I have two daughters. Two daughters. They're not twins. Oh, they're not twins. Okay. I'm the twin. <laughs> no, you're the twin. <laughs> but okay, I don't but have you twins. have two daughters, so you have to move. Uh, Miami is certainly not like Boston culturally. Uh, you know, it has been this, I don't know. I, I complain that people are rude and the traffic is bad and, and a lot of other things like that. And it's a, it's, it's a very different, uh, how, how have you been able to adjust? Um, do you have any ideas about how to make Miami a little bit friendlier? <laughs> uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on, Move, on your move to Miami, I I, I really like Miami. Um, it's you know, someone said um, Miami is is um, is comfortably diverse. <laughs> We are comfortable with diversity. Not every community is, um, uh, but Boston is also a very diverse city. Don't get me yeah. wrong, and obviously it's a very cosmopolitan city. But certainly but more intellectual. Yeah, yes. yeah, but it, yeah, uh, they, you know, it has a lot of universities for yes, sure, yes. And, and and some of the top universities in the world. It's a much smaller city. Um, you know, they they ship out the the revelry and all of that to New York, which is nearby. So so it's it's it it is a smaller city, but but Miami has this element of diversity. It is one of the most. I mean, in some indicators, it is the most cosmopolitan city in the United States. Uh, you know, neck and neck with New York City. Um, so for me, because I myself am a very diverse human being, uh, I, uh, I I feel very comfortable here, and um, and I like the fact that it is really at the crossroads. Miami does have this, what I call its geographic endowment. You know, we talk about the financial endowment of the university <laughs> and, and we're growing that, but we have an, a unique geographic endowment. Being a connecting city, a city that where north and south, east and west meet. Because Miami is both the crossroads of the Americas on the north-south dimension. But by being an Atlantic city, it faces Europe, it faces Africa, it faces the Middle East, and through that, Everything we call the old world is present in the new world. Every every nationality, every ethnic origin is here. And Miami is probably the center of gravity of the new world. Dr. Frank, we are almost running out of time. And I have about 20 other questions here <laughs> for you. So I guess I have to, uh, I was going to ask you what you like to eat, etc. But I want to ask you, why do you think you are so successful? in everything that you have done. Well, thank you. I, I, I also have failed and I have learned from failures. I, I, and uh, I think that I have a very important inner drive, which stems from my family origins. I grew up uh, with a constant message from, from both my parents that we needed to give back to the country that made our lives possible. So I have a very deep sense of, of, of corresponding to that generosity of strangers. And gratitude. And, of gratitude. And, and, and to me, the way I've expressed that is through healthcare and through education. Those have been my avenues, but there are many others. And because I have that, I think, motivation, I tend to, to be very passionate and, and, and very committed to, to things I do. Um, because we only found success, find success in helping others and deriving a very deep, very profound sense of fulfillment and transcendence within ourselves. That's, that's I think, the recipe. Okay. One final <laughs> question. If you had a magic wand or a silver bullet, 
what would you do with it? In terms of education, I think, to me, the dream is a system, an educational system that perfectly matches and, and, and puts together excellence with access. We need to improve access and excellence. Excellence, having excellent institutions with little access, leads to a lot of social resentment and frustration mm -hmm. and deepens inequalities. But access without excellence, when people have access but the education is not of the mm -hmm. highest quality, mm -hmm. leads to further actually worsening of those inequalities. So my dream is that education takes its place, first of all, as the most important avenue so that every person can reach their full potential. And secondly, as the most legitimate uh, pathway for upward social mobility and for social harmony, for because we don't just transmit factual knowledge, we transmit values. And it is, it, it is an essential part of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of the social fabric. So that would be, if we had a, a way to bring together excellence and access at all levels, K through 12, higher education, that is what I feel would be the pathway to a better future. We are so fortunate to have a man of your heart, a man of your caliber in our community to lead our most prestigious university. And we are so proud to have you on this show. Please come back and join us again and all the continued success to you and to the University of Miami and to our public. Thank you for listening. This is Marta Perez and Excellence in Education.